Thank you for joining. Hi, everyone. Um, apologies, it looks like we have a technical difficulty with Hank Kim from NC Purs. I am sure he'll be back with you. Just hold on with us for one moment and we will start in just a second. Just give him another minute, and if he doesn't come back online, we'll just get started. Okay, thanks. thanks for joining us. I can see people are arriving. We're going to kick off in just a minute. If you've joined us, thank you for being here. We're just waiting for our host to rejoin the call, which hopefully will happen in a minute or two. Ah, okay, great. We're just going to kick off. So um, thank you so much for joining us on this webinar. Uh, we're thrilled that you've been able to make the time to talk about this important topic. And we have a very interesting series of conversations for you over the course of the next hour. My name is Tom Rivit Karnak. I am a founding partner at Global Optimism. It is a small organization founded to precipitate transformation on the road to dealing with the climate crisis across a variety of different sectors. In my background, I was at the United Nations. I ran political strategy for the UN in the lead up to the Paris Agreement. And I run Global Optimism together with Christiana Figueres, who was the executive secretary of the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change at that time. So today we are going to hear from a few real experts in the field. But just before we do, um, I would like to invite my friend and colleague, Brooks Preston, to just step in. Uh, Brooks is a managing director at Macquarie, who are very generously hosting this event. So Brooks, why don't you just give us some comments and then we can dive into the rest of the agenda. Yeah, thank you very much, Tom. And, and, and thank you, um, NCPERS as well, for, for organizing this session. Um, we were thrilled to be able to um, to host this uh, this hour because one of the things that at Macquarie we have come to realize is the inextricable linkage between sustainability and, and long term returns, but also the major changes that have occurred over the past couple of years and will continue to occur in light of um, the finance community's response uh, and 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 preparation and management of all the issues attendant to sustainability. So we're very pleased to have been able to, uh, to sponsor this and, and to have brought the, this group together. And uh, we, we sure hope it's, it's very useful for, uh, for you as well. Um, and I might add that um, uh, both my parents were the beneficiaries of, of teachers' pensions. So uh, this audience has a special, um, a, a special appeal for myself. So Tom, back to you. Very nice, thank you, Brooks. Great. OK, so um, I'm just going to give a couple of words of comment and then I will introduce the panelists and then we'll dive in. Unfortunately, uh, we don't today have a video from Christiana Figueres uh, for technical reasons. However, that will be sent to you after this event and will be available to view afterwards. So there's going to be plenty of opportunity to see that. Um, however, um, I do know that the comment that she wanted to make was about the importance of this sector and this stakeholder group and this moment. Um, Christiana is fond of saying that we have just entered the most consequential decade in the history of humanity. And that feels like an exaggeration when someone says it as boldly as that, but it really isn't. We will know by 2030 whether we have successfully 
gotten on top of this issue and reduced our emissions in line with managing climate risk, or whether our control of the climatic system and our ability to have an impact on that has begun to slip away from us with all of the devastating consequences that that will entail. We have really left this now to the last minute. We haven't between now and 2030. And that makes this the most consequential time really that anyone's been alive in the history of humanity. Those of us who are here now are either gonna work out how we deal with this issue with all of the complexities that that entails, or we'll be the generation that failed to get on top of this. Those people who are listening to this, both in the live stream and subsequently in the follow-up, hold disproportionate positions of influence because you have influence over capital allocation decisions. And this is really where the rubber is going to meet the road and where this decision is going to be made. It's not only there. Of course, there is a strong interaction between the finance sector, between policy, between business strategy. And we'll get into the interactions there to some degree throughout the course of this hour but what I'd just like to say as a setup is this is it, and you are the people who are going to make the difference. So really appreciate you making the time and look forward into delving now much more into the how. So I'd just like to introduce our speakers. First, we have Sagarika Chatterjee. Uh, she is the Director of Climate Change at the UN Supported Principles for Responsible Investment, working with investors based in the US, EU, UK, and China. Right now, she is seconded part-time to the UN COP26 high-level climate champions team, where she co-leads the finance stream. She's had a long career in finance herself, including 11 years at BMO, Global Asset Management, formerly FNC. Sue Reed is the fi senior finance advisor for the COP26 climate champions team. She's a lawyer by training and will, I'm sure, be known to many of you for the six years she spent at Ceres leading their climate and energy work. Sue and I are also colleagues at Global Optimism. We're along with much else. She leads our work with the Asset Owners Initiative, the Net Zero Asset Owners Initiative. Uh, Brooks Preston, you have heard from already, Managing Director at Macquarie Group at Macquarie Infrastructure and Real Assets. Long career in finance, energy transition and government. Far too humble to tell you that he was the force behind Macquarie, making a significant commitment to get to net zero by 2040 across Macquarie Asset Management. So great to be here with you all today. Uh, we're gonna dive in. Um, and I'd like to start with you, Sagarika. So if you don't mind, just kicking us off with some opening comments, and then we'll go to our panels and we'll continue with the discussion. Great. Thanks so much, Tom. So maybe what I'll do is start a bit in terms of the global investor perspective on climate and then go a bit into net zero, 1.5, and then tiny bit, just a bit more practical on the kind of steps you can take if you're near the start of your journey. And so I think when thinking about climate, what's become really clear to us is a couple of trends in terms of the investor lens. And one thing I find really useful, if you haven't read it already, is actually Cal Alster's low carbon transition investment policy, because that gives you a really good snapshot of the kind of things to be thinking about. And I think the first important thing is thinking about how climate risk and peer review scientific findings will materially impact on your investment policy. And then I think the second thing is how so much is happening already Already there are public policy changes, technological advances and the physical impacts that we're already starting to see all driving forwards the transition. And then I think the third implication from this is really around the need to understand um, the transition, potential impacts and what actions could be taken. And from this, the things to think about are, well, how transition ready is my portfolio today? And looking forwards, how well placed is my portfolio, uh, including at an asset class level? Then the second is around, well, what do I need to do in terms of stewardship, my engagement, my corporate um, uh, engagement, as well as my policy advocacy and proxy voting? And then next, I'm just going to turn a bit to specifically net zero and 1.5. So I think it's fair to say in the global investor community that until recently, a lot of the focus on climate has been around climate risk um, on TCFD 
and also particularly on below two. So the focus very much now that we've seen across markets is a shift towards thinking about net zero by 2050. And the game changer here for investors has really been the IPCC special report. Um, so world scientists came together um, to do a special report on 1.5. And I think the relevant point here for investors is that what the report highlighted is the need for really drastic cuts in emissions reduction, steep declines, and across sectors with implications across the portfolio. So this isn't just about um, a little bit of green bonds. It's about sector-wide changes, um, and those changes need to come through into the portfolio. And what we've seen um, globally, I think, Tom, is different investor initiatives um, from CA100+, plus, which gathers together investors to engage with the top 100 companies, through to asset managers, the Net Zero Asset Managers Initiative um, that Brooks is a part of, and also um, Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, all increasingly turning to this idea of net zero by 2050 and 1.5 science-based thinking in how they're looking at their portfolios and the actions they take forward. I'm just going to wrap up, Tom, because all of that can sound, you know, a very kind of high level science, you know, what does it all actually mean? Um, to highlighting one thing. So if you're thinking about, okay, that's great, get all of that. What do I do? Uh, we published a little guide with London Stock Exchange Group. It's called the Investor Guide to Climate Collaboration. And it talks through four simple steps, um, and they they're, don't have to be followed in order. Everyone's at different stages. And they basically look at how you can start incorporating climate in your investment process, in your engagement, uh, in your disclosure to beneficiaries um, or to clients, um, and also target setting, um, which is increasingly emerging um, as, a, as a way to respond to climate risk and opportunity. And in the back of the guide, you'll also find a directory of what are the initiatives, what are the tools and frameworks, and no matter where you are in your journey, in thinking about about climate risk in your investment policy, thinking about 1.5, you will find um, things to do. Um, finally, I'm going to finish by saying um, that if you're newer to thinking about net zero, um, this is very much complementary with thinking about climate risk, whereas I think climate risk is all about transition risk, the physical impacts, um, thinking about how this will play out. Um, some more of the net zero thinking that we're seeing emerging is more about how do you align your portfolio. And the good news is that methodologies are being developed today on how to do this. With that, I'm going to stop. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate that, Sagarika. Um, that's really helpful and really appreciate how practical that is as well to enable people to kind of get on the road. So what we're going to do now is we're going to have a conversation for the next 10, 12 minutes specifically on what's going to happen this year. This is a very big year for climate. COP26 is happening. This is the first step up since the Paris Agreement was adopted in 2015, where countries have to come back to the table. And as you will hear in this discussion, that makes this everyone's business. So we're going to dive into that for 10 to 12 minutes. And then we're going to talk more about the opportunities and the risks in the energy transition. So I'd just like to kick off um, in that first conversation about COP26 really picking up where Sagarika left off. And if it's all right, I'm going to start with you, Sue. Sagarika talked about net zero. And I know that that is a concept that has just got so much momentum that is building behind it. So many talking about net zero portfolios, net zero strategies. Can you just unpack for us kind of 101, what does that mean for an asset manager? Sure. Thanks so much, Tom. Thanks, Brooks and Macquarie and NC Pers, and delighted to be on this panel with uh, my co-lead from the High Level Champions team, Sagarika. Um, so this is it's it's funny. This is both a big basic question: what really is net zero in the context of the finance sector and asset owners, but also one that has confounded a lot of people. So it's really important to sort of lay it out. Um, that literally it means that all of the greenhouse gas emissions associated down to the asset level across your portfolios in aggregate, so public equities, private equity, um, fixed income, all of it, um, that um, the down at the asset level, um, that the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions are removed from the atmosphere as are contributed to the atmosphere. 
So you get to net zero. Now, pretty much nobody is at net zero emissions in their portfolios or even in any sectors at this point in time. So it really is a journey. And it requires, as Sagarika has pointed to, a stock take in terms of looking at the carbon intensity and aggregate emissions from your portfolio. Setting the target is absolutely crucial because what we're talking about, as others have mentioned, is nothing short of transformative change across sectors, across our economy. Um, and then setting interim targets and actively working to make progress toward them tapping the range of investor tools that I imagine we'll get into in more detail as we, we move through this conversation. Um, and um, what's important is target setting at the outset, understanding what net zero and that ultimate um, objective looks like, um, and then working toward alignment um, and um, reducing emissions by half um, by 2030, and then uh, moving into what can be called alignment with net zero by 2050, and keeping yourself on track to ultimately reach that objective, ideally before 2050. Fantastic. And I think I, I, I kind of can't resist going from there to you, Brooks, because we also have Brooks on the line having made a net zero by 2040 commitment. And I'd be, it would be great if you could just talk us through a little bit sort of what's involved in that, how will that be realized, how was it constructed, and what, what have you learned about setting a net zero commitment as an investor? Yeah, so great. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. And in the context of what Sagarika and, and uh, Sue said, you, you know, for a lot of institutions, it's kind of like getting dressed in the dark um, you, because there is so much that's unknown. You put a tie on <clears throat> and a jacket and then you walk outside and see how it fits. And it kind of you realize the tie doesn't quite match the shirt and the, the jacket could use a cleaning and I guess I'm wearing a skirt for the day too, right? You don't you don't really know because there is so much that is um, uh, to unfold in terms of how we achieve this. But um, we were committed to doing this for uh, a couple of reasons. One is uh, in the infrastructure space, as as much as anywhere, a lot of the value in uh, the investments we, we make is embedded in the terminal value of the assets. So of course we want to own assets on behalf of our clients that are sustainable in, um, in 2050. And frankly, we want them sustainable in, in 2040. So there was a, there was a real alignment with our, our asset class from the infrastructure perspective, but also from infrastructure debt. And then quickly you expand that to the listed securities and other, and it just, it just makes uh, sense. Um, we also felt like uh, infrastructure, you can't get to Paris, you can't get to the, the agreement, the 2050 target without transforming infrastructure. Uh, it's a necessary part of this overall global journey. And again, as sort of the largest owner operator investor of, of these uh, assets, it, it made sense to, to us. And then I think you also have to think about the communities that um, we operate in. And, and this again, extends well beyond infrastructure, but particularly infrastructure, you know, is essential assets. And that was as true during COVID as it was at any time. Um, you know, we, we needed the ports to be able to operate. We needed the bridges open. We needed hospitals to be functioning. We needed power and water and all these different things. And, and that that to us is, is also a sustainability and resilience um, uh, factor. So really the, the why we did this, it, it all links together in a very logical way. It's aligned with our commercial, our fiduciary, um, and, uh, and, and ethical reasons. In terms of how we're doing it, um, so maybe I'll just touch on, on four things. So obviously you start by measuring the greenhouse gas emissions of, of the uh, portfolio that you have. Uh, where we have direct influence on the board, that's a little easier in some regards than where we may not have direct influence. But at the end of the day, we need to understand sort of where we are, and ultimately that means what sort of risk we hold. And then what we really uh, sought to do is is um, commit to putting business plans in place by 2022 that will allow our assets to achieve global uh, net zero by 2040. Now, in some cases, the technologies may not be commercially available um, uh, you know, in 2023, but we at least have line of sight to what it takes for all of these assets to be sustainable in global net zero by, by 2040. Um, now, in terms of implementing these plans, again, it, it goes to where we have, have influence, um, and we, we're already 
on the road with, with a number of the assets and happy to, to talk about examples uh, uh, later on in the call. And then I think finally, the fourth thing that we committed to, in addition to measuring, reporting, implementing is, sorry, measuring, planning, implementing is reporting. And, uh, and we will re report on an annual basis uh, how, how we're doing on, on that um, objective. Uh, we haven't yet firmed up exactly what the metrics are that we will be reporting one, one year to the next, but there is a commitment to show how close we're, we're getting to, to 2040. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll pause there. That's sort of the why and how um, of our 2040 commitment. Great. That's really helpful. Thank you, Brooks. And I think it's what's really interesting now, if it's um, Sagari Kunsu, you sit at this really interesting intersection between investors and the intergovernmental process representing the race to zero and this kind of uh, group that sits kind of between the national government negotiation process and the private sector. I mean, Sagarika, I'd be fascinated to know why is it important to the international process to reach the next phase of the Paris Agreement, kind of what Brooks just said? Why, why is that investor action important to national governments? And then we can look at it the other way around as well. So I think for the scale of the changes that are needed to safeguard the planet, um, it's clear that public finance will certainly be needed and government policies, you know, the pathways, how are we going to get there, are absolutely critical in the foundation. And at the same time, the financing is going to be a critical enabler of unlocking the pace uh, we can go at for sector transition. And um, private finance has proven um, able to innovate significantly uh, in the past. And so looking forward, I think the national governments and finance community can increasingly work much more closely together to really grapple with unlocking some of the technological changes that are needed. And I think the private finance community can play a role both today in today's investment portfolios. So um, for investors that can be about engaging with the highest emitting companies in the portfolio alongside like-minded peers, benchmarking as corporates to see where are they, where are the emissions reductions going to come from, what's the company's strategy, how engaged is the board, are the right people on the board as well with climate competence. Um, and at the same time, the finance community can play a very significant role in terms of articulating to national governments and internationally what they need in terms of the policies at a sector level, what the big asks are. The biggest ask has to be for ambition in implementing the Paris Agreement that we have today. Um, and there's much more that we need to see in international cooperation as well as at the national level. I think when that voice from the finance community to governments to step up in ambition is accompanied with credible actions the finance community is taking and articulating what else is needed so that investors can move faster into the more difficult areas, um, that will be increasingly uh, very, very effective in terms of unlocking the changes that are needed. Mm. No, that's that's very helpful. And, and Sue, I, want, I mean, one great example of what Sagarika just talked about is the Net Zero Asset Owners Alliance, which was pulled together and which you've been deeply involved in, in terms of both commitment and, and action, as well as effective engagement with national governments to push for more ambition. Tell us a bit about that and kind of what's been committed to, who's involved and how it's going. Thanks, Tom. Um, and, and I have to say the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance is absolutely extraordinary. Um, I'll say a few words about it and what are the drivers and what is it already doing and setting in motion. But kudos to um, Sagarika, who's been one of the principal motive forces behind this effort that brought together initially in 2019 a dozen major asset owners, um, pension funds and insurers principally. It's now expanded out to include at least one sovereign wealth fund and charitable foundation and is growing out geographically and in terms of um, type of institution. But now the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance has 35 um, major asset owners um, with five and a half trillion in assets under management. And they've all come together recognizing the extraordinary suite of financial risk associated with climate 
and the extraordinary risks associated with inadequate action on climate change, um, risks that are posed directly to their investment portfolios, and the need to work collectively because there are some, some big gaps um, on the landscape that no individual investor can solve alone. This really is an all hands on deck situation. And so even as it has been growing and building its own foundation, so its own governance and metrics and methodologies and so on, some really groundbreaking work. Um, the Alliance also has been extraordinarily productive looking at, for example, the International Energy Agency did not, has not had a 1.5 degree Celsius aligned scenario that could be used for planning and looking at corporate investees and what is their glide path to reach net zero across different geographies and sectors, for example. And so the Alliance went out and commissioned work from University of Technology, Sydney, One Earth Climate Model to illuminate what are the timelines that need to be applied, for example, for phase out of coal infrastructure in North America and Europe versus in Asian geographies. Um, what, what is our, our timeline on natural gas infrastructure, for example, and across um, half a dozen major sectors, and then translated that kind of data and intel into a really robust data-backed position paper on coal phase-out that then is resounding with a range of um, government and, and corporate leaders um, who are all working at this time to get their arms around these timelines and trajectories. The Asset Owner Alliance also importantly um, has um, developed um, through a very thoughtful process, a protocol for setting 2025 interim targets. So looking at what do each of the members need to achieve in terms of greenhouse gas emission reductions, not just by 2030, the end of this decisive decade, but where do they need to be by 2025? And some really thoughtful protocols that then each asset owner is taking back to develop their own targets for 2025. Um, about a dozen members already have publicly released those interim targets. And then they're working collectively. This is fodder for a much deeper and broader conversation, but working collectively on the pillars of core areas of investor engagement to move the needle on greenhouse gas emission reduction, recognizing this can't be a massive divestment at scale. We can't divest our way collectively out of the climate crisis. This requires robust engagement with investee corporates. It requires policy engagement where collective raising of voices is far more powerful than individual institutions operating alone. It calls for engagement of asset managers um, to call for the kinds of products that are needed to lower greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so across the board, um, the Asset Owner Alliance, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance that is hosted by the UN, by PRI and UNEP FI, um, is proving day in and day out the advantages of collectively working together and that these issues are all solvable when you harness that smarts and energy and commitment um, to move down this pathway together. Fantastic. So, so in a minute, we're going to move on and talk more about the sort of choices and opportunities in the energy transition. But just before we do, Brooks, I'd love to just come back to you. I mean, one thing that strikes me just listening to Sue is that it's it, what's amazing about this landscape, apart from other things, is it's so lumpy, right? You know, in some areas, it's so sophisticated and so far moving. And yet for others, kind of the concept of ESG can be new and it can be a bit intimidating and overwhelming. And I just wonder, you're someone who's worked in this space for a very long time. You've kind of seen the evolution of ESG. Can you just give us some comments on kind of how we got to today and, and what, what you, how you see that evolving into the future? Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's a great question. Um, and, and we answer it a lot, actually, from, from, uh, from all sides. Um, and, and maybe, you know, just from the NCPER's perspective, uh, my prior role uh, before Macquarie was head of investment funds at OPIC, which is the U.S. Development Finance Bank. And, and, and our job was to, was to pick emerging market fund managers who were sustainable. So in some regards, it's, it's, uh, it, it's very similar to the role that, that I, I imagine you have uh, going forward. Um, the other thing that's interesting about, about the development finance institutions, um, of which there's, you know, well over 30. Some of them have been doing sustainable investment for 40 years. They've been integrating sustainability into diligence, into sort of the assessment of the culture, into their themes that they invest in, into how they create value, into reporting. So in some regards, it's not that new. But Tom, as you point out, uh, for many folks, it is in fact very new. And there, there's five things that have really changed 
uh, in the past uh, couple years on an accelerated basis. One is, is of course, that ESG used to be at risk management, and now it's focused on value creation. A second thing is that reporting used to be optional, um, and now it's on the verge of required. Sagarika uh, mentioned uh, TCFD, but uh, now Europe has uh, um, SRFD and, and EU taxonomy. That's moving very quickly. Uh, mm -hmm. Sustainable used to be siloed. You could have like one expert who sat in, in a corner and talked to folks. Now it really has to be integrated both in asset management and I think also in, um, in, in asset allocators. Uh, the fourth is, is that obviously divestment has been a big theme. We're at the 10 year anniversary of 350.org. That led to $15 trillion of endowments and foundations reducing their, their fossil uh, commitment. And, and, and so that has, has already happened, uh, but quite quickly. And I think the fifth thing is that the opposite is now occurring, which is people are choosing themes based on their potential contribution to uh, to, to to climate solutions. So if if you're an asset allocator and you haven't participated in sort of those five things that have occurred, switching from risk to value, uh, uh, putting an emphasis on reporting, integrating sustainability, divesting, focusing on thematics, then there is some catching up to do. If you have done that, I think the things to sort of look for in the future are, um, again, something that was mentioned earlier, engagement is going to ramp up. So it's not just about finding and investing in the shiny green new assets, but actually investing in the turnaround stories that, that need to be cleaned up in order to uh, achieve our targets. A lot of value creation uh, there, in, in our opinion. Uh, I think resilience is going to get priced in. So if you haven't figured out how close your asset is to sea level, now's the time because it will get priced uh, in, in the uh, uh, months and, and years ahead. The data is becoming available uh, for flood and so on. And then I think the third thing that is happening is, um, is just the market forces uh, are accelerating. Uh, what Tom referred to is, as the Paris effect or the decisive decade. I mean, you could own a coal-fired plant in a coal-friendly jurisdiction and think that, well, I'm, I'm okay. But, but actually, you're probably not. You're probably not going to be able to lend, you know, get loans for that asset. You're going to have a harder time insuring that asset. Uh, you may not be able to attract the, 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 the best talent for it. You can't recruit for it. You certainly can't grow it. And you may have trouble selling it. So even if you're in a coal-friendly jurisdiction, the market is moving away from you. And I think that's going to happen at, at a uh, accelerated pace as well. So that, that's sort of how I'd summarize sort of what has happened and, and what to look for in the future. That's fantastic. Thank Back you. you. Really, really, really helpful. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on. Um, we still have a few more minutes to have a discussion, but I can sort of pivot the conversation a bit. We've been talking about COP26 and this year, the road to kind of the next phase of the Paris Agreement. But of course, many of those who are participating in this, as well as yourselves, are kind of focused also on the choices, challenges, and opportunities that come from this particular energy transition. There's a lot of gray area between the topics we're talking about. But Sue, can I just come back to you and to ask about there's a lot of talk about stranded assets and about risk. Can you just help us understand how extensive a problem is this? How much of the average portfolio is exposed to stranded assets? I mean, Brooks just touched upon this in terms of pricing and risk. Just talk us through that. Sure. Thanks, Tom. So um, stranded assets, of course, can occur in almost any context, but specifically in the context of climate change and solving the climate crisis. There was a real wake up call about 10 years ago when this think tank called Carbon Tracker Initiative put out analysis looking at, OK, what is the value of all of the high carbon energy resources on the books of companies around the world? And what is the delta? What's the gap between that aggregate value um, and um, where and, and that volume of energy resource and what we actually can allow to be used without fully baking the planet, right? Without um, really going into cascading climate crisis. Um, and that was a real eye opener because even at that time, they illuminated that trillions of dollars of assets already were at risk of stranding. 
And, you know, that's what so much of this effort is about in terms of setting net zero targets and moving toward them, because there's such an opportunity to cap and limit the amount of stranded assets. The more that investment is made, especially in long-lived infrastructure um, and even different energy fields, the bigger the risk of stranded assets is. And so this is something that um, to a large degree is manageable, even as some assets assets almost surely are going to strand at this point in time, unless we have climate failure, which is not something we consider an, an option. Um, and uh, recent experience with the coal sector in North America is really illuminating that um, you know, it's it's not just um, that assets may strand because um, policies are put in place that say, as of tomorrow, you can't burn any more coal, or you know, as of next year, we need to reduce greenhouse gas gas emissions by X amount. There are also all the usual market factors at play. So we saw this really short or quick structural decline in the North American coal sector, principally actually due to market forces that coal no longer was able to compete with natural gas and renewables um, in the electric generation context. And so we saw coal assets in both the fuel and in the power plant infrastructure being made obsolete in real time. And some of the, the coal majors in the U.S. lost 90 percent of their market value within the span of a year. And so that's a really instructive example in terms of looking at manages, managing these risks. Most investors were or many investors were caught off guard. We can see the direction of travel. There's some excellent analysis put out um, by um, Mark Lewis called Wells, Wires and Wheels that gets at um, vehicle transportation electrification and how um, we can expect a much faster decline simply due to market and competitive forces of the oil sector, even setting aside uh, climate policy. So you can expect a lot more stranding than previously had been understood. So it's really important to um, for each institution to get arms around this kind of exposure, especially with long-lived assets where the risk of stranding can escalate dramatically. Thank you. That's great. Okay. Appreciate that, Sue. And Sagari, can I just ask you to talk about, from your perspective, you 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 know you look across so much that's happening in the investor space as well as the intersection with policy. Can you just sort of touch on some of the bigger questions that haven't yet been addressed that will unleash further private finance even faster? You know, what might some of those issues be? How will those interactions happen? Sure. So the um, I think I think the biggest question that's out there is. How will policy action play out and what would that mean for my portfolio? Um, and um, that's obviously at a global level, but also a geographic level. So one um, piece of work that builds on the stranded assets piece by Carbon Track and actually Carbon Track are involved with this, um, that we're finding has had a lot of traction with global investors across geographies is some analysis uh, we commissioned called the inevitable policy response. And this takes the thesis that markets today haven't priced in climate risk and also has the thesis that there will be a government response to climate change or set of responses, but it's being left very late. Therefore, when it comes, it will be forceful and potentially disruptive. And then the piece analysed, well, what are the eight policy levers? And these are the ones that we think investors are watching out for. So carbon pricing, coal phase out, clean power, zero emissions vehicles, um, low carbon buildings, clean industry, low emissions agriculture and forestry. And so we're trying to help answer some of the questions around how will policy play out in those particular policy um, levers that I just outlined. And we find that results in a really engaged conversation with our investors who are trying to understand what exactly does this mean? And then once you've got a, your own view on what does this mean as an investor, um, what does that mean in terms of the actions that you're going to take at a very practical level? Um, and related to that, for example, could be, well, what does this mean in terms of the capital expenditure alignment of the 
corporates in my portfolio, where are they today? Um, when I look at a benchmark such as CA100 plus benchmark, um, where do I think I need to go? And then what are the kind of questions I'm going to be asking them um, in my next engagement? And how am I going to be voting on that in the coming AGM season? Fantastic. Thank you, Sagarika. So, so Brooks, in, in a minute, I'd like to invite you to just give some comments in general on financing the energy transition in action. And then we're going to go to some questions from the audience. So, so if you have a question, please do start thinking about it. And, uh, and Hank is going to help us to moderate those. Um, but just before we do, I wonder if you could just also take us through what are some of the most exciting opportunities that Macquarie is investing in right now? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's an interesting question. We I was on a call with the State Department earlier today, who asked, you know, how much of the portfolio is being invested, how much capital is being invested in in climate change solutions, and um, it wasn't very helpful. But I kind of had to say all of it, <laughs> uh, because really, no matter what we invest in, there is a there is a climate uh, angle in, in in many regards. And I'll, I will give you a couple examples. So, you know, start with renewables. That's where most people start. Um, but you can take it even one step further. So we have a, a renewable as a solar uh, investment in India, which is all well and fine. But the cool thing there, I think, is that one of the problems with um, that area is that it is dirt during a certain season, the farmers burn their crops and that creates uh, smoke and, and dust and, and that reduces the uh, efficacy of the solar panels. So that company engaged with the farmers to figure out how to reduce the, the burning and, and the air pollution in order to improve the performance of the, um, the solar farms nearby. So certain renewables, but you can go you know, one step further. So we've, we've invested in a number of data centers, which consume a lot of um, energy and um, uh, our, our U.S. data center only uses renewable energy. So that's, you know, an important step towards global net zero. And, and the next step for them is to figure out, well, what's the carbon footprint of the shells, the buildings that, that hold uh, those servers? Um, so that's another example. Ports, um, we, we've invested in a number of ports and, and there's a, a, a huge range of opportunities there. So one of the things we, we do ask of all our portfolio companies is to form a cross-functional subcommittee of the board, um, uh, of, of, uh, the, I'm sorry, of, of, the, of the management committee to, to explore how, how they can implement uh, sustainability. We had one port who um, said, okay, we'll, we'll do that and asked for volunteers and half of the employees raised their hand and said, yeah, I, I want to be a part of that. Wow. Uh, so they had to create several subcommittees to accommodate 75 different people. And, uh, and that port, you know, is doing things from changing the, the routing of the trucks and, and, and the, um, the straddle carriers. It puts solar on the roof. It um, has uh, implemented some water recycling. It even decided that, well, we could send this waste concrete to the landfill or we could put it offshore and create fish habitat for the same cost. Um, so there's a whole range of, of these sorts of things, um, you know, to Sue's point on on stranded assets, we, we do own, you know, gas distribution networks. Uh, are those stranded? Well, not if we can put hydrogen th through those assets. And with um, a, a gas network in, in the UK, we've already started to uh, do that. And to take hydrogen sort of, you know, one step further, uh, this is this is not in the Macquarie Asset Management Portfolio, but this is something that uh, because of the risk profile, we're doing more on the, the principal uh, side of the, of the bank for now, but we have uh, land leased in, in Australia to do uh, massive wind and solar uh, in an in a area that has extremely high capacity uh, right next to the sea. There's an opportunity if costs come down low enough to convert that, that uh, renewable energy into hydrogen or green ammonia and then start to supply Southeast Asia, um, Korea and, and other parts uh, of the world with green hydrogen as well. So there's a huge, there's a huge ra range of, uh, of different opportunities. Uh, I, I would say that, you know, all of our teams in all of our investments are, are looking now at, at how our global net zero 2040 commitment needs to be applied to the portfolio. And, and that's, that's true for, you know, our alternative assets, but it is more and more true for the listed side as well. Fantastic. 
Now, um, now you, you also, we have you now giving us information about um, financing the energy transition in action, but you've kind of just done that already. So I don't know if there's other things you want to you want to add because you just gave us a great example of how that's happening at Macquarie. Are there broader points that it's useful to add in before we invite some questions from the audience? No, I, I mean I think let, let's um, let's let's go to questions uh, quickly. I, I guess the only thing I, I would add is um, that this this energy transition. Uh, I think for for some people, you know, is 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 scary for real real uh, legitimate reasons. Um, it, there is some unknown to it, but I, I would emphasize that there is a lot of opportunity as well. And so, uh, one of the things that we're quite focused on at, at Macquarie is not necessarily just turning the lights off because they're dirty, but rather putting a lot of emphasis on. How do you power those lights in a cleaner way as soon as we can? And, and so I think from you know the allocators on, on on the phone, when you can find opportunities to help solve a problem, uh, that is a great place to both create value for the portfolio and and also for the communities and and um, uh, and, and other stakeholders in, in the area. So I, I think that there's a real opportunity in, in this, this energy transition, whether it's mobility, energy generation, transmission, um, you know, a, a whole range of things. So I'll just leave it there, Tom, I think, and see if we have some questions. Right. Tom, I just, yeah, thanks. thanks. I, yes, I just wanted to add one point. I'm just so, so aware that, um, you know, maybe there's some um, very large funds in our audience, but maybe there's also smaller ones in the PRI signatory base. We have such a range. We have funds that are headquartered in China, in Australia, or in France, um, or, or, and obviously in the U.S., and so I, I think what's also really useful to think about is if you're a smaller fund um, or a medium sized one, um, how could you work with your managers so that they are real partners in this? Um, it is really overwhelming at first, um, but they are likely very well situated first to answer a question around, well, where is my portfolio today? Um, and just understanding like what are the range of responses you get from your different managers on that, I think, will in itself give um, you a lot of insights. And then second, how could they work with you on the opportunity side, given your current you know, investment objectives, the risk return parameters that you have, um, and what more would be needed? Um, and therein, I think that conversation in itself really helps unlock a lot of the kind of innovation that's needed and the way we're all going to have to work through this, um, not only managers, but also everyone in the investment chain, um, our investment consultants, right down to credit rating agencies and sell-side brokers. Fantastic. Thank you, Sagarika. So, um, so we're now going to go to the Q&A part of the, of, the, uh, of the event. And so I would invite Hank to, to join us and moderate some questions. Great. Thank you, Tom. And Thank you, everybody, for joining us. And let me begin with a sincere apology for my technical difficulty at the beginning of uh, today's webcast. Uh, for those who tuned in over the last year or so, you know that my introduction always includes the part about how we need to adjust to the new normal of you know, technical glitches. Uh, but I really didn't think they would uh, apply to uh, my introduction. So my apologies. Uh, I will say, though, th that uh, I didn't realize that I was cut off, so I gave a master's class in a beautiful introduction, so I'm so disappointed no one got to see that. <laughs> in any case, um, thank you again, uh, everybody, um, uh, you know, uh, Sagarika, uh, Brooks, Sue, Tom, for joining us. In terms of questions, I was going to lead off with the, uh, with the topic that Sagarika just uh, ended on, which is... As you all know, uh, the National Conference on Public Employee Retirement Systems, NCPERS, we are the largest trade association for state and local pension plans with about 500 uh, plans that are members. Sagarika, you started off your presentation by referencing CalSTRS, uh, but obviously CalSTRS is somewhat of an outlier in terms of the assets under management and the resources it can bring to bear and how as a plan of, of a mega sized plan that it can, it can move the needle um, by itself. But the vast majority of our members are somewhere around what I would term mid market plans. So state and local plans with assets under management somewhere north of 2 billion, but under say 30 billion. Um, 
Federica and others, would you mind expanding upon how these mid-market plans can really take advantage and help collectively or even individually move the needle um, and, and focus on sort of the lack of resources that these uh, plans may have? And even though they may be crimped in terms of the number of people in the investment staff and the dedication of sustainability by its uh, plan sponsors or the trustees, how they can take advantage of the sustainability movement and how they can do it without incurring costs on the plan. Sure, great. Well, I'll take a first stab and then um, ha um, uh, uh, enable um, Sue and um, Brooks to add a bit more. So I'm going to go back to when I mentioned at the start, kind of a four-step approach to implementing a climate change response. And on that first bit, which was around investment process, I do think a good place to start is, well, what is your climate change policy? And then how could you integrate that throughout the investment process that you already have today? And there's some great examples that are out there already that you can draw on. And then the second step that I've mentioned was around engagement. So I think for a medium-sized fund or a smaller fund, but also probably for a larger fund, um, what's quite useful to do is to speak with managers that you have today around how could they um, be a part of existing collective efforts such as CA100+, plus, which gathers together over 500 investors to engage with the top emitting corporates that they hold together to reduce emissions, improve governance of climate risk, and improve climate disclosure at those corporates. And if it is possible to engage um, directly, that's great. But, it, but if not, I think managers will be able to help with this quite a lot. And related to that, with policy advocacy, managers are likely already involved in initiatives, for example, in the US series, and um, plays a very active role um, in climate policy advocacy. Um, and there may be existing initiatives that managers can ensure that um, you are active in, um, so that whether it's in the US or internationally, um, you're really focused on encouraging the policies that are needed for investors to take more action. Then I'm going to cover a bit on disclosure. Um, and this is an area, again, where I think we can really ask managers, um, how are they implementing TCFD, so the climate-related financial disclosure recommendations developed under the stewardship of Mark Carney and Mike Bloomberg and the industry task force that included um, many investors. Um, that could also include a question around, well, can you publicly disclose what you're doing on TCFD um, and enable us to disclose on TCFD as well? And then that TCFD reporting is not just an end in itself, but can also help as an internal management tool in understanding how the fur, how the fund is looking at climate risk um, and how um, it could em enhance its risk management processes. And then finally, on target setting. So um, this is a newer area, but there are resources that are available today um, for asset owners that are medium-sized funds um, and also their managers to draw on. And that includes science-based targets initiative work, as well as a target setting protocol that's been published by the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, as well as, of course, um, the Net Zero Asset Managers, which we mentioned Brooks is a part of, um, that is also developing a target setting approach. So in each of those four areas, there are things that a more um, a smaller fund can do. And finally, what I wanted to say um, that I think is effective no matter what the size of the fund, but particularly if you're smaller, is working with peers. This is really difficult. So you probably have a lot of existing networks and initiatives you're a part of that you can collaborate through. And that will also reduce the transaction costs that are involved um, and be, be a more efficient way to implement um, your work in this area. Um, I hope that's given a sufficiently granular response for the kind of things that um, a medium-sized um, fund in the, in the U.S. can do without imposing extra cost burden. That's uh, Sagarika. That was very good. Thank you. Anybody else have any comments or thoughts beyond what Sagarika details? 
Yeah, I, oh, I'm happy I, that... I might... Go ahead, Go Sue. Ahead. Go ahead, Sue. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, course, I, I completely echo everything that, um, and I won't repeat what Sagarika said, other than that last point about working with peers is absolutely crucial that we've seen, um, you know, we all work with um, investors around the world here in the United States. I'm based here in the U.S. Um, you know, we see that funds often are, our public employee systems are, are often um, not structured with anything like the level of staffing and in-house resources that we see around the world, right up north in Canada, the third largest fund. Man CDPQ manages almost all of its assets in-house and has deal teams on the ground in places like India to take advantage of renewable energy investment opportunities. And that's not the case here, even with the big funds like PERS and STRS and New York State and so on. And so we have to be more creative and um, leverage um, you know, the collective effort and completely agree with Sagarika's suggestion, you know, whether you can join PRI or join Ceres and its investor network on climate risk and sustainability, where you can get some support in terms of even navigating, you know, TCFD um, assessments and, and disclosures, um, you know, carbon asset risk. Um, investing in renewable energy infrastructure, just transition, all of these issues are being grappled with collectively by these investor networks. Um, and so that creates, um, you know, an accessible forum for um, navigating through all this more um, expeditiously and, and at low cost. Um, and the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance, I was remiss in not mentioning, right now there are only three members in North America, and one is the largest, CalPERS, um, but also Westpath and David Rockefeller Fund is really a pretty small charitable um, foundation in terms of um, their, their corpus, and they are a core active participant in the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. And so it's worth either looking at joining for a mid-sized fund or re just relentlessly borrowing the materials that are developed. They're all posted online. Um, they're all available um, on an open source basis for others to take up. So, and, and we on the Champions team are also help, um, happy to be um, conduits in terms of connecting the dots and making sure that folks know where to find these resources. Sue, I'm glad you touched upon that. And Brooks, I know you wanted to make a comment, so I, I will uh, give you a chance in a moment. But Sue, just on that final point that you made, um, in terms of helping you know mid-sized and smaller-sized funds uh, connect the dots, um, you know, uh, Sagarika talked about uh, sustainability investment policy. I think something even basic as that: where could a plan? find an open source uh, document that they could uh, model or uh, modify? Well, I could speak briefly and then hope others will chime in. Series regularly updates its blueprint for sustainable investing, and that's out there. You have to share your email address with the organization, but that's the, the complete cost of accessing uh, that particular resource. And, and there are many others. PRI does some fabulous reports and, and guides on this subject and others. Great. Thank you. Brooks, you had some comments. I was just going to make a very simple comment, which is that... Um, all of your members are allocators and uh, asset managers are in the service of allocators. So just ask the question, relentlessly ask the question um, of, you know, what is this particular manager doing about sustainability? And I think, you know, you're going to have the meeting anyway. So uh, don't neglect that question. And, and over time, I think you will be able to sift and sort the leaders from the laggards. Um, and uh, you're in a privileged position to be able to ask, you know, any of us on the on the asset management side of, of the table to to explain what we're doing. Just keep doing it. <laughs> keep, keep asking the question. I, I do realize we have uh, less than two minutes, and um, I know that the response won't be as thorough. But I, I feel like I we do need to ask this question, which is. You know, from a U.S. Uh, uh, pension, state and local pension fund perspective, one of the threshold questions I know that trustees and, and others get asked is relative to sustainability and other sort of uh, um, directed investment is how does our fiduciary responsibility, how do we, you know, how does our fiduciary responsibility apply to uh, sustainable investing? Um if someone could answer that in a minute or less, that would be wonderful. 
I'll, I'll take uh, a step. Oh, there's lots of people. Brooks, you go for it. <laughs> I'll, I'll take 20 seconds. We made our 2040 uh, commitment because we think it's aligned with our fiduciary obligations. Over to you, Sagarika. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, we, as a PRI has done a load of work on fiduciary duty, and obviously it is a material factor um, for all um, US funds to be thinking about. Um, but overall, our finding is um, that consideration of climate risk is very much compatible with fiduciary duty and note that in other markets outside the US um, may even been seen as remiss if um, this isn't considered as part of fiduciary duty. Wonderful. Tom, you started off. Uh, uh, you want to say the last closing word? No, I, I, this has been delightful. I've been thrilled to be able to do this and to be a participate in this. Thank you, Hank, for the introduction. Thank you to the three panelists for joining. It's been very insightful. I hope it's been useful to the participants and look forward to further conversation. Wonderful. Thank you. Great way to end the session. Again, uh, let me close by uh, apologizing for my technical difficulties and, again, thanking our panelists and moderator for this great session today. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Hank. Thank you, Nancy.